All right, this is Jace from the Comic Source. Here with my friend Manny, who was uh, my co-pilot at Long Beach Comic Con this year. And we're on our long drive back from Long Beach to beautiful Central California. So I apologize if there's any uh, background noise from the car. Uh, we're just going to give our thoughts about the convention. And uh, we'll show you a lot of pictures. There was a lot of cosplay. Talked to a lot of creators. Uh, all in all, it was a pretty good show. Uh, I kind of had felt like it was going to be bigger than last year. It seemed like they had uh, more name people and more panels scheduled. But all in all, honestly, it felt it felt about the same as last year. So uh, Manny didn't attend last year. So let's uh, let's see what he has to say. Overall thoughts about the show, Manny. Overall, it was pretty good. I enjoyed the fact that you know, it was a little bit less people at WonderCon, a little bit more intimate. So it really gives you a chance to talk to some writers, talk to some artists. Although it made it a little bit more difficult to talk to Jimmy and Amanda because they were the most popular people there at the show. And that was long all weekend. But uh, got a lot of books signed, got some great uh, commissions done, and uh, very friendly people. That was pretty good. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Jimmy, Palmiotti, and Amanda Connor were probably like the stars of the show, the, the kind of the biggest names there, kind of the biggest draw. So for that reason, people weren't really spread out amongst uh, so many other big name creators, uh, which in turn meant that Jimmy and Amanda had pretty much had a giant line all weekend. So uh, that was one thing we had to contend with. So just to give a little quick uh, recap or a rundown on uh, the show, uh, we got there, it was a two-day show, Saturday and Sunday. Uh, if you pre-ordered your badge online, you got to go in uh, at 9 o'clock instead of 10. So we got there and uh, headed into the show floor at 9 on uh, Saturday morning. And it was pretty early, not a lot of people. In fact, a lot of the creators weren't even there yet. And uh, one cool thing that Long Beach does, they're kind of known for their artist alley. In fact, last year they laid claim to the fact that they were the biggest artist alley uh, of any show in 2013. I don't know if that was the case in 2014. San Diego had a huge artist alley this year, as did WonderCon. But uh, Long Beach, definitely, they're in contention. Uh, they really take care of their artists. Uh, they are the centerpiece of the show. And uh, because of that, Long Beach actually puts them in the center of the show. They're in the center of the show floor, and then all the vendors and retailers and uh, publishers are kind of uh, on the outskirts. They kind of surround Artist Alley. So the first thing we did when we got there is we walked up and down Artist Alley, uh, just kind of scoping out the scene. Uh, I, as I often do, I had a, a, a list that I made uh, ahead of time of artists whose work that I enjoy. Uh, some I knew from before, some I just uh, had discovered while going through the artist list at Long Beach. So we just kind of walked up and down the aisle, see who was there, said hi to some people we knew, like uh, Richard Friend and uh, Brian Bucoletto, Jesse Mesa Toves, uh, just people that we've gotten commissions from before or people I knew from previous shows. Uh, I think the first person that we actually uh, stopped and talked to, uh, and it was a chance for Manny to get a commission, was uh, Derek Friddles. Now, I had gotten a commission from Derek last year. He did a really awesome full-page, full-figure, uh, pencil and ink, Incredible Hulk for me to start off my uh, Marvel sketchbook. And then at San Diego this year, uh, he did a quick uh, steal from the Superman family for me. Uh, his style is pretty clean, uh, a little on the cartoony side, and uh, he's, he's a real nice guy, and uh, his art is uh, pretty solid. So uh, Manny stepped up and uh, got out his Batman sketchbook, and uh, I'll let Manny take it from there. Yeah, I just uh, gave him the freedom to choose whoever he wanted, and uh, like I was telling Jace earlier, I telepathically wanted him to do Mr. Freeze. Just a headshot, but uh, you know, I, want, I seen some Mr. Freezes that he had there on the table, and uh, lo and behold, uh, a couple minutes when we went back to pick it up, there's a headshot of Mr. Freeze, and I would, couldn't be more happy with it. We'll post a picture of it a little bit later.
Yeah, it was a, a really great uh, commission. And you have a, a list of characters that they can choose from in your book, as I do, right? Yeah, correct. They, uh, as, as they go along, they fill their name out, and whichever character they feel like drawing, uh, they, um, they go ahead and draw it. That way it gives them a little bit more freedom instead of maybe uh, they always do Batman or maybe they always do Catwoman or whoever they're really known for. So this way they're a little bit more uh, happy to draw, I guess. And usually that results in a, in a better commission. Yeah, that's a real good tip. Um, they draw somebody that maybe they don't get to draw all the time. Um, there's a few things I like about that. Uh, like Manny said, it gives them the freedom to do somebody that they're not asked to do a hundred times uh, a day. Uh, it also gives you a more unique commission. Uh, there's not a lot of people that have uh, some of these more obscure characters in their sketchbooks. And also an artist, if they're having fun drawing, they're more likely to add a little more detail or maybe they'll throw in some shading or some color just because they're enjoying what they're doing so much rather than drawing a Batman or a Superman or a Spider-Man for the you know millionth time. Don't get me wrong, they're happy to uh, give the fans what they want, but sometimes it's nice to do something different, you know, just like uh, in your job. You get tired of doing the same thing over and over, so. And I believe after we, uh, you got your commission from Derek, we went over and talked to uh, Drew Edward Johnson. Now, I had seen uh, Drew Edward Johnson at Big Wow uh, in San Jose this last year, but uh, I only got to go on Sunday, and by that time he was already like booked up solid. That was a, a huge commission show for him. So I wanted to be sure to get over to him uh, early at Long Beach, and uh, he, I think he had maybe one commission before us that he was doing. So we both whipped, whipped out our sketchbooks and left him there with uh, Drew Edward. I, uh, again, it was my Justice League themed sketchbook, gave him the artist choice, whoever he wanted to do. And uh, I think Manny left his uh, DC sketchbook, just uh, any DC character. Um, I was going with the full figure and Manny was going with the headshot. So we left it with Drew Edward and uh, he took down our number and uh, then he said he would text us later in the day when the commissions were ready. I think after that, you remember, did we go talk to Richard Friend? After that? Uh, yeah, we did. We were um, trying to set up. Uh, Richard Friend had a panel with a couple of other guys uh, for uh, tips on inking. And they needed uh, somebody to record it for them. They're going to post it on online. And they were more than happy to help them out. So we're just uh, setting that up and seeing how we can help out. Yeah, uh, I'm friends with Richard on uh, Facebook. Friends with Richard Friend. How about that? Um, so he had asked on Facebook if anybody going to Long Beach would be willing to record this panel for him because he has a, a YouTube channel that's kind of an instructional, uh, you know, do-it-yourself kind of thing that he likes to do. Uh, get a little more intimate with the fans. Give uh, the fans that are, uh, you know, interested in getting into inking uh, just a way for um, Richard to connect with his fans and give back a little bit. So, um, so I, I told Richard, yeah, I'm going to Long Beach. I'd be happy to record it for you uh, and to video it and. Uh, you know, I'll talk to you when, when I get there and we'll see. So actually looking at the, the panel info uh, just a few days before Long Beach, I realized that uh, all the guys that were on the panel with him are guys that I that I know, that I've met, uh, creators that I you know, am familiar with and I talk to at conventions and see them there all the time. So that was really cool. It wasn't just uh, helping out Richard, who uh, you know I consider a friend, but also Art Taber was on the panel. Uh, Norm Ratman was on the panel. Uh, Danny Mickey, who I don't know that well, uh, but have, have met a few times. And then uh, Victor Olasavo, also, who's uh, the anchor for Humberto Ramos on, uh, on Spider-Man. So, unfortunately, the, uh, the equipment in order to uh, broadcast or, or show the, uh, the inking or do demos, uh, should put it up on the big screen so the audience can see, it wasn't working quite right. So, in a way, it almost made for a better panel. Um, it was a little more personal. They just kind of uh, talked about um, the way they came up and uh, how they learned and their different techniques. And uh, I have to say that of all the how-to panels I've gone to, this one was probably uh, kind of the most in, in, in intimate and informative. Uh, I've, I've gone to inking, uh, how to ink panels or how to draw panels in the past uh, where the person just draws or inks and kind of talks about what they're doing and they tend to be a little dry. I felt like this panel was a lot more personal and 
uh, I'll put a little link here. You can go over to Richard, Richard's uh, YouTube channel and, and check it out. Uh, a lot of fun, especially if, you, uh, if you're interested in, in inking. Get a lot of info. Um, and if you're interested in inking, contact these guys. They're more than happy to, to, to help you, uh, to give you some tips and tricks. And, uh, yeah, they're, they're great guys to talk to. If you're at a, at a convention, be sure and go talk to Richard Friend. Guy loves to talk. He loves to meet his fans. Uh, he's killing it right now on uh, Wonder Woman with David Finch. First issue is just about to drop. And uh, we were talking to him today, Sunday, uh, about a few of the new things that uh, David Finch is trying to kind of give a little bit of a different feel on uh, Wonder Woman. He definitely wants it to have a, a, a little bit of a, almost a more feminine feel than, like, say, his work on Forever Evil. So uh, we look forward to that for sure. And uh, like I said, Richard's a, a great guy. Art Tabear, a great guy. Norm Ratman, a great guy. Um, definitely, like I said, talk to these guys. Check out their art. Check out their prints. Um, they're all really happy to talk to fans, really friendly. And, uh, you know, I can't say enough about uh, how much you should go and, and take advantage of uh, the chance to talk to these guys at a convention. So I think after we talked to Richard, uh, I think we said hi to Jesse Mesa Toves. There's another one of just the, the really nice guys in comics. Uh, he, he only has out, like, kind of self-published stuff right now. He hasn't done anything for the big two. You know, he has a regular day job. He kind of just does it as a hobby, like a weekend thing. Uh, but his, his stuff is really, really awesome. Um, and he really could use uh, the support. And I have to say that not only would you be doing me a favor by uh, going up and saying, hey, you know, I heard about you on the Comic Source podcast. Jace sent me over to get a commission. Uh, and you'd be doing him a favor uh, by supporting him, you know, monetarily. You'd really honestly be doing yourself a favor because this guy, his commissions are, are ridiculously inexpensive for what you get. The detail uh, in his commissions is just amazing. I'm going to put up uh, the hot roll he did for me. Uh, at WonderCon right here, so you can see what I'm talking about, and you can see the detail, and uh, just amazing, like $30, pencil and ink, all this detail, just ridiculously good. Full page. Yeah, full page. So, if you're at a show, and Jesse Mesa Tobes is there, get a commission from him. Please, like I said, do yourself a favor, seriously. So anyway, we said hi to Jesse. Always good to see him. Great guy to talk to. Uh, I believe we went over and said hi to Todd Knock. Todd yeah, and his yeah, wife. Uh, yeah, Todd and his wife Dawn. Yeah, now, he was already booked with commissions by the time we got there. Yeah, Todd. If you want to get a commission from Todd, which uh, you know his stuff's awesome. You, uh, he takes five commissions a day usually, and you you have to get get to his table early because, like I said, he fills up uh, really fast. And uh, sometimes toward the end of the day, if he's finished off those five, he'll take, uh, you know, another one here or there. Um, and then, you know, it just kind of depends on how many people he's got coming up to talk to him or have him sign books, you know, how often he gets interrupted. But another one of the really, really great guys in comics and his wife, Dawn, she's just a superstar. Definitely. Definitely very friendly and, and helps out a lot. Makes his life a whole lot easier. He, he, he could not be doing what he's doing without our support. I'll tell you that right now. Yeah, uh, I, I know I've said this before, but it, it merits saying again. Um, a lot of these artists, you know, their families are there supporting them, their wives, their kids, their daughters. Um, don't ignore them while you're standing there waiting for your commission to be done or whatever. You know, they're people too. You can talk to them. If it wasn't for the support of the families uh, of these creators, uh, the creators wouldn't be able to do what they do. You know, so Dawn is, is another one of those superstars. You know, she, she's... In fact, she, she told us uh, Sunday, uh, right before the show, show closed, that it's so nice for her to, uh, for her husband to have a job where uh, he has these fans and they come up and talk to her and she gets to hear all these nice things about her husband. So, really cool. Like I said, she's a superstar, super sweet lady. Uh, definitely go up and, and, and say hi to the Knox uh, if you're ever at a show that they're at. Let's see, who else uh, did we talk to in Artist Alley? We said hi to Brian Buccoletto, Booch Kitty. We met, we met the, the next writer for Batgirl. I mean, not writer, uh, artist for Batgirl. That's right. Babs Tar was there. She got invited to uh, 
come out to Long Beach Comic Con this year, and she said, sure, why not? Uh, she didn't have too much um, that girl work. You know, obviously the first, uh, her first issue hasn't dropped yet, so didn't really have uh, much Batgirl uh, stuff for her to sign. She did have her print, um, one of the promotional pieces for Batgirl that uh, has been released so far. So we, uh, we saw her, she was just setting up, um, just wanted to say hi, we asked her if she was going to do uh, commissions, and she said she probably was, but maybe not, uh, not going to take too many, but she would definitely remember us because we, you know, we asked first thing. Uh, I mean, it was probably like 15 after 9 when we asked her. So, uh, I wasn't 100% I was going to get something from her, but uh, within probably an hour or so of thinking about it as I walked around the show, I just became more and more convinced that with her style and the new direction of Batgirl, uh, the book is going to blow up and she's going to get huge. And I'll be able to say I got a commission from her way back when, when she first started out. Um, at probably a much uh, lower rate than uh, is going to be uh, later on. Yeah, that's going to be a good tip. If you see her in any show in the next few months, get a commission now, or else you're going to end up paying double, triple later. Yeah, in fact, when I when I picked up, what I did was I left my uh, I left my sketchbook with her, um, kind of more toward the end of the day on Saturday. And, uh, you know, left it with her overnight, said, you know, I'm going to be here all day Sunday, you know, take your time, don't rush, whatever. And uh, that was my Justice League sketchbook again, telling her, you know, choose who you want. And uh, when I went to pick it up today, she chose to do Black Canary. You can see it here. And uh, just, I mean, just a gorgeous, gorgeous piece. She says Black Canary is one of her favorite, so she was happy to be able to draw uh, Canary. And uh, she said the same thing that Manny just said, yeah. Uh, couple years she's going to blow up big and it'll be double or triple and uh, I told her yeah for sure I know I mean I told her that's why I got this commission now because I know you're going to be going to be huge Fat Girl's going to be a big success and uh, just a really really sweet girl uh, great artist super friendly um, she had a lot of people coming over and I congratulated her on kind of hitting the big time with, uh, with work on Fat Girl and a lot of people looking forward to it the uh, book's not even out yet and there's already a lot of excitement so Definitely take take Manny's advice. If you if you see her at a show in say the next six months, uh, you better uh, jump on it while you can. So uh, who else did we talk to in Artist Alley early on Saturday? In Artist Alley, we talked to Norm a little bit. That's right. We talked to Norm Rapman, uh, inker on the Flash. Uh, actually, we walked by his. Uh, ta- it was pretty early. I think right after we talked to the Knox, uh, we walked by Norm's table. Just wanted to say hi uh, to Norm. You know, he's a, he's a good guy. I always say hi to him at um, conventions. He's done, he inked this Nightwing. That, uh, I bought this Nightwing. Uh, it was just pencils from Brett Booth at Phoenix Comic Con. And uh, then I got Norm to finish it up for me. It was uh, one of the uh, boots and one of the gauntlets wasn't uh, quite finished. It was just rough sketched. So Norm finished those off, inked the whole thing, a little light background you can see here. And uh, so Norm's a friend, a uh, real good guy. And uh, he, he was like swamped right at the beginning of Saturday. So just kind of stuck my head in there and, and said hi and we talked to him later um, then kind of went on our way David Barron was also there uh, colored a, he's a color artist for Valiant Comics uh, I, I met David just real briefly at San Diego uh, this last year and uh, you know he's been a, he's been in the business for a long time he's kind of seen it and done it all uh, as far as color artist goes now, what's really cool about David is uh, he mentioned that at the Valiant panel here at Long Beach. Now, well, you know, first of all, I should say that unfortunately, due to, due to some unforeseen circumstances, Dinesh Shandasani, the COO of uh, Valiant, wasn't able to make the trip. So their head of sales, Adam Freeman, came all by himself with a big load of uh, Valiant books and set up the booth all by himself, manned the booth by himself for most of the weekend. Big with, props to that guy. With, with some help uh, from a few of uh, the Valiant Fans Forums members. Yeah, big, prop, big props to that guy for coming out to the show on his own so Valiant can have a presence uh, here at Long Beach. But uh, because he was by himself, he was going to have to cancel the, the Valiant panel. Well, uh, good old Doc Solar from the Valiant Fans Forum. He also uh, hosts the OTV, that's only the Valiant podcast. I'll put a link down here. You guys can go and check it out. 
uh, he didn't really want that to happen. So he took it upon himself, along with uh, the color artist David Barron and another color artist, Alan Pasolacqua, both color artists for Valiant, decided they were going to have a little informal panel, talk a little bit about uh, working for Valiant and a little bit about what Valiant has coming up, you know, at least as far as, as what they knew and, you know, what they were allowed to say, um, you know, David and uh, Alan both worked for Valiant, so they maybe knew a little more than they could say. They certainly knew more than uh, Sean. But uh, they, the thing that I found really interesting, or one of the things I found really interesting that uh, Dave Barron, David Barron said at the panel was that he almost was getting a little jaded working in the industry. Um, not necessarily tired of doing it, but just, you know, when he started working for Valiant, just the, the passion that the creators and uh, the uh, executives of that company have for the books kind of reignited his passion. And he's uh, more excited than ever to be uh, working on the things that he's working on. So uh, it was great to see David, uh, great to talk to him about Valiant and uh, poker and just, uh, just life. David's uh, another one of the uh, real personable guys, uh, super knowledgeable, uh, really intelligent, well-spoken. So again, if you're at a show that he's at, recommend uh, walking up, introduce yourself, uh, check out his, his work. He's got a lot of really great uh, prints and uh, you know he'll talk to you about the process, coloring, what goes into it. Uh, yeah, just a really, really cool guy to talk to. Uh, this was the first time I'd met Alan um, he actually uh, has done the color on Battle Pug, uh, art by Mike Norton, and uh, he, I'm not that familiar with it. Um, I've heard of it. Uh, everything I've heard uh, have been good things. I believe they've won an Eisner and a Harvey Award for it, and uh, I'm definitely going to check it out uh, real soon here, and, and possibly I'll do a little quick uh, uh, shout-out in a future episode for it give you guys some info where you can go it's a uh, it's a web comic it's a digital comic you can get it online and then uh, Alan told us that once a year Dark Horse kind of collects all the uh, digital stuff and puts it out in print form so Alan also a really great guy happy to be uh, working doing some work for Valiant um, you know that's one of the things about Valiant as a company uh, to a man I've never heard a creator say something bad about working for Valiant no, I haven't either. This is my first year experiencing, uh, really hanging out with those guys, and they're just, just regular guys, family guys, very friendly. Um, I had, I had questions about um, Archer and Armstrong, and one of them, very, very happily, out of his collection, took an autograph number one, the old uh, style, and actually, uh, it was a, it was a zero. Oh yes, it was a zero, and uh, said, read it. Just like that, I was very surprised because my hands were full of grease. We were eating burgers, actually, and uh, he, was, he was nice enough to make sure I read it. And, yeah, hopefully, you know, it, uh, you guys get a chance to meet them. Uh, yeah, they become friends real quick. Yeah, it was pretty cool. So we're, we're having burgers. Manny kind of uh, asked the question, what's this Archer and Armstrong all about? And uh, Aram, shout out to Aram from the Valiant Fans Forum. Uh, he says, hold on, pops up out of the booth, goes out to his car, comes back with like a 9.8 uh, grade gold logo, Archer and Armstrong number one, signed by Bob Layton. That's right, comic legend Bob Layton had signed this book. And here is Manny, crowded in this, uh, we're crammed into this little booth, you know, there are like six or eight of us, this little booth at a burger joint in uh, downtown Long Beach and Manny's cradling this book in his hands trying not to get any grease on it reading uh, Archer and Armstrong but we're all discussing uh, comics it was uh, it was pretty cool there's a little picture of it right here see how ridiculous he looks <laughs> yeah so uh, definitely if you're at a show Valiant's there go up and talk to him ask him uh, about the books ask him uh, you know let him know what kind of books you're interested in Valiant has a, a a good uh, eclectic mix of uh, different kind of superhero books, very cohesive universe, and uh, you know, if you if you go to the booth and you talk to the creators, you're gonna you're gonna hear the passion for their work come through when they're talking to you. Uh, there's often members of the Valiant Fans Forum, the Valiant Fans Community, 
hanging around the booth. Uh, it really is um, a family. Uh, the fans, it's a great community. Uh, I, you guys, uh, if you have watched previous episodes, you know what they did for my son after him having lost his sketchbook at uh, San Diego last year, having it stolen. Um, they donated some, some books. They had an auction, gave the proceeds uh, to Jaden, my son. He was able to get a new laptop. I mean, it wasn't Valiant's fault that the sketchbook and the laptop got stolen. They did it out of out of just caring for their fans. It just you know blew blew me away. So yeah, don't get asked for the books. Pick them up. Pick up Armager, uh, Archer Armstrong. Uh, pick up um, Bloodshot. Thing. These are these are really good books. I mean, if you're starting to get tired of you know DC Marvel mainstream. This is definitely the way to go. Yeah, I, I, I agree. You guys, you know, if, like I said, if you're if you're regulars, if you watch my my uh, blog on a regular basis, you know uh, that I review Valiant Comics uh, pretty frequently, and it's because I, I I'm trying to get you guys to read more Valiant. Um, you know, they're growing at a steady pace, but they can always use more readers. But really, you'd be doing yourself a favor. These are high quality books, Harbinger. One of the best books that's come out in the last three years. Like, no doubt, in my mind, just an amazing, amazing book. Another one of the comic publishers that was there, that Manny and I are both big fans of, uh, is Top Cow. Yep, Top Cow. Uh, Think Tank, uh, Aphrodite, Wildfire, um, obviously all Matt Hawkins related. Uh, not to mention uh, one that I have yet to read, but... Very shortly, I will start to uh, rise of rise of the magi. magi. Right. Yeah, last uh, the last episode was uh, a spotlight on rise of the magi, and that I dropped that right before uh, Long Beach, and unfortunately, uh, I wasn't able to get it up as early as I wanted. So uh, even though Mark Silvestri was there uh, from like he was there from 12:30 until seven, and I did not see him leave the top cow booth that entire time. Now, I wasn't at the Top Cow booth that entire time, and it is entirely possible that he got up to use the restroom at some point, but he had a huge line, and he was just there for the fans. Talking to the fans, smiling, taking pictures, uh, he was doing a few commissions, um, yeah, just, you know, like I've said before, hardest working guy in comics, Mark Silvestri, and, uh, he did watch uh, the episode uh, late Saturday night and sent me a tweet thanking me. And, uh, and in fact, his wife, Bridget, uh, made sure that I got a free Rise of the Magi t-shirt on Sunday. So that was really cool. Um, watch my last episode uh, if you haven't. And you can get some details on Rise of the Magi. Great series. You can hear my thoughts on it. And uh, yeah, Top Cow, they put out high-quality books. And I would say one of the best things about uh, Top Cow books... This is true of Rise of the Magi. This is true of just about anything that Matt Hawkins writes, is you get a lot of bang for your buck. You know, there's kind of a trend in comics these days with the whole decompressed storyline. You pick something up, uh, you know, it costs you four bucks, three bucks, maybe five bucks, and uh, you read it in less than 10 minutes, sometimes in five minutes. You know, it's not a great value entertainment-wise. But uh, a lot of the Top Cow books, you get... You get what you pay for. You get more than you pay for. Uh, they're good, rich, deep stories. Um, a lot of the things that Matt Hawkins does uh, will be like a four issue or a six issue. So they're very accessible. Um, you know, you're not going to make a huge commitment. Uh, you, you know, it's only maybe you only pick up four books. You get a great story, and maybe he goes back and re revisits that uh, that particular world or that particular property later on. Maybe he doesn't, but give him a try. Um, one of the cool things that, that Top Cow always does is they, they give away a lot of their digital books for free, the first one or two issues of, of their series. So you can go to topcow.com. If you scroll all the way down to the bottom on the right, there's a, a box there usually, and they'll have uh, the free issues. You can check them out digitally, get an idea of, of which of their books you might enjoy. So definitely go check them out. Um, they're an Image Partner Studio. You know, Mark Silvestri was one of the original uh, founders of Image, and uh, he just he does a great job. You know, he's he's kept the studio going. 
um, some of the other creators, you know, have kind of fallen off or they just ended up selling their studio to other companies or, you know, they just haven't put out a consistency of product over the years. And I, I feel like that's one of the really awesome things about Mark, uh, one of the real admirable things. Uh, he's kept his studio going. He's kept the books coming out. He's there for his fans. Um, just big supporter of Tom Cow. You know, much like Valiant, they really they really care about their fans. It's a good community. Um, uh, Matt Hawkins is very accessible on social media. Um, he's very accessible about shows. He loves to talk about his books. Um, you know, go up, say hi. Um, one of the one of the cool things about Matt is you get him talking, and he'll drop spoilers without even realizing he's doing it. Oh yeah, he we must have drank two or three Pepsi's while we were there, and he just goes on and on and on and it, and honestly you you don't care because it's you know you're you're learning about what's coming up next you know it gave us a little hint of what maybe they're thinking about doing on think tank next and it's really interesting yeah that's right uh, i think he said uh may he's hoping that the season two of think tank which will be in color is going to come out uh he's got tithe uh starting pretty soon with his uh partner creative partner rasan ekadel so we look forward to that. Really looking forward to Tithe. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm, you know, Think Tank's like my favorite book. So looking forward to that as well. But pretty excited about Tithe. Um, little heist, ripping off uh, churches, mega churches. So looking forward to that. Um, love Matt Hawkins. Love his work. Great guy. You gotta love his science class and his books. I mean, you don't only just get the comic, but you get a section called Science Class where everything that's in his book is backed up where you can look up different websites that he has um, links to on his book and you can you can look up some of the science behind a lot of the things in his book and it makes it so much more interactive it makes it so much more content than just a story you can spend a lot more time with it a lot more bang than your buck than your typical book so i highly recommend it, it, it it's great yeah no arguments here uh, let's see. Uh, well, since we're talking about good writers, I think that same morning we talked to Steven Siegel. Oh, that's right. That's right. And uh, we also went by the Man of Action uh, booth, and uh, there were quite a few people there that, are, that work on uh, Man of Action. Joe Kelly, Joe Casey, and uh, Stephen T. Siegel. Now, uh, he did a book called It's a Burden, uh, and it was a, it's a graphic novel. It's really great, really great book. I mean, this was way back in like, I don't know, 2007 or 2008. Uh, I just kind of stumbled across this book. I picked it up. Um, kind of a semi-autobiographical kind of, I, I had heard good things. Uh, I'd heard it had won an Eisner. So I picked it up, I, you know, I read it. I was just blown away, just blown away. I, I hadn't really gotten to the uh, convention scene at that point, but uh, the book impressed on me enough that I, I looked up uh, how to get in touch with uh, Stephen T. Siegel. I found his email address, and I emailed him about how, how great uh, the book was, and he immediately got back to me. So uh, I, I hadn't ever met him in person. And I hadn't ever really talked to him since then. And so uh, I walked up to the Man of Action booth because uh, I enjoyed the series Bounce uh, from Joel Casey. So I got Joe Casey to sign that, and then I noticed uh, standing right next to him was uh, Stephen T. Siegel. And uh, just a little uh, ways down from him, there was, uh, he had copies of his uh, It's a Burning. And so I mentioned to him, hey, I, you know, I read that a long time ago. Uh, great, great book. You know, just really awesome. Really enjoyed it. And, uh, you know, he thanked me for that. And I said, yeah, in fact, you know, I, I had sent you a an email and you got back to me and so that you know that was really cool to, to, to put a face to the name and then he mentioned uh, this book that was a, sort of a sequel uh, called Genius so I definitely had to pick that up I, I was really intrigued by that um, you know I kind of read the, the little brief synopsis or, or blurb on the back cover uh, it sounded uh, really interesting so I'll probably be covering that in an, in an upcoming episode uh, but again really really great guy to talk to um and uh i think he had another book there that he did with tim sale uh a hardback called uh, amazon right yeah that's correct i picked that yeah. up yeah 
and uh, it takes place in, uh, well, the Amazon in Brazil. It focuses on a missing uh, worker, and a reporter goes down to see what's going on, and I just started a few pages, and, and it's very detailed, and I uh, look forward to seeing what happens next. Yeah, I'm probably going to have to borrow that from you when you're done, by the way. Um, so, uh, when I picked up Genius, um, Manny had mentioned uh, that he had read a few pages of Amazon because I, I didn't pick up Genius till Sunday. So, Manny had a chance to read a few pages of uh, at the Amazon overnight. And uh, he mentioned to uh, Stephen that he he'd started reading it. And uh, it definitely wasn't a quick read. It was definitely, he was building a, a real uh, depth of story and a, a rich uh, world for these characters to inhabit. And uh, Stephen pretty much said, well, you know what? I think you're my favorite guy of the convention at this point. And uh, gave him a free copy of uh, another one of his books, Solstice, which uh, we don't really know much about at this point. Um, but uh, again, it's Stephen T. Siegel, and his stuff's uh, all pretty great. So probably going to have to borrow uh, borrow that, too. So Although it looks like I stole it, because uh, I guess he wrote the wrong name on it, so that's why he had an extra copy. But uh, hey, it doesn't matter. Free comic, free novel is a free novel. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously I was his favorite person. He's, uh, I was lucky enough to take a picture with him, and he's uh, joking me. But uh, yeah, I mean, well, once yeah, we, clearly you're his favorite person. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what's you know, we talked about the book for a few minutes, but then he wanted to know about me. What did I do? And uh, you know, my family and, and things like that. My goals. And so, you know, it's really, really easy to uh, talk to. And, uh, you know, now, next time I see him, you know, it'll be a lot easier to talk to. And so, yeah, definitely, you know, when you see, you see him at any, any event, you hit him up and definitely read uh, some of his work. Yeah, again, just goes to show uh, what a great uh, community that comic creators are uh, as a whole. I mean, we go to these conventions, they go to the conventions uh, as creators, you know, as part of their job. We go to these conventions as fans, but in a way we're all part of the same community. We're all there because we love comics, we love the medium. Uh, so that's all you really need to have, that, that shared common interest in order to strike up a conversation with these, uh, with these creators. And you know, who knows uh, where the conversation might take you, who knows what you might have in common or you know, things in the past uh, that you have in common or maybe you uh, have visited some of the same places, so don't be afraid to go up and talk to these people. Um, you know, it's kind of a pet peeve of mine. I see people that they'll stand in line for, you know, 30 minutes or an hour uh, to get a book signed or to get a sketch, and uh, they get up to the front of the line and, you know, they have their head down and they don't even make eye contact. They, they maybe mumble a thank you as they walk away to the creator. I mean, that's, that's not much fun for the creator. That's, I mean, a lot of these guys and uh, girls too, you know, they're there to interact with the fans. They, they want some feedback, you know? They want to know how to get better. Um, obviously, uh, they're doing it because they love it, and, you know, they want to. They want the feedback. They want to know what the fans think, um, and, and if they do have a passion for their work, they want to know how they can improve it. So, you know, I'm not saying to, to, to get up there to the front of the line and, you know, rip apart their work and, you know, things like that, but, you know, tell them what you like. Tell them what, what positives uh, are that you liked about the story or, or things you thought maybe they could have done different. Actually, one of the one of the wives mentioned that to us. He uh, uh, said, you know, you can talk to him while he's working. You know, he, 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 he draws all day. Nobody talks to him. You know, talk to him. That's right. We were talking to Don Knock. Yeah. She said, yeah, the poor guy, you know, he's at home. Uh, Todd. Uh, it's kind of a solitary job, you know, drawing comics. He doesn't he doesn't go out to an office, you know. He doesn't have coworkers that he gets to to talk to and you know have that interaction. So that's part of the reason that he does the conventions is so that he can, you know, get out and uh, and, and meet people and get a chance to talk. So um, there there are a few artists that that have a hard time talking and drawing at the same time, and you'll kind of get that feel if they're drawing something for you. And whenever you ask them a question, you know, they'll stop and look up. Um, but for the most part, you know, a lot of these guys are really, really great at what they do. And they can talk and draw at the same time. And they're they're more than happy to talk to you. Well, since we're talking about artists, I think around this time we picked up our commissions. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So, yeah, we went back to, uh, to Drew Edward Johnson to get our commissions. And like I said, I got a full figure uh, in my Justice League sketchbook. 
and I was very pleasantly surprised to see that Drew Edward had chosen Big Barda, Big Barda of the New Gods. Um, and the reason I was so happy that he chose that is because, number one, I'm pretty sure that he doesn't get to draw Big Barda very often. And in fact, when I said that, he's like, yeah, that's part of the reason uh, that I chose her. And the other thing is, it's not um, its not something I'm going to go up and ask somebody for. You know, they're, they're, for the most part, I, I let the artist choose who they want. Every once in a while, I might request a certain one. But I don't know how comfortable I would feel uh, going up and asking somebody to draw a big part of it just because she's not that well known and maybe they might need reference or something like that. So, um, yeah, I was real happy to see that he chose Big Barda. And the commission is beautiful. The detail, uh, the rendering, and her face and her armor, just, just I'm over the moon. This is just an, an awesome commission. And uh, then Manny opened up his and was in for a little bit of a surprise. Yeah, definitely. When I had uh, left my book, I had asked for a headshot uh, due to my budget. When I opened my book, although I should have been pleasantly surprised, I was more uh, shocked at the fact that he had done a full figure black Adam. Let me tell you, that thing looks amazing. So uh, I talked to him a bit and asked him if he had hurt me. And uh, he said, that was, that was, you know, it's very hectic. I'm sorry. So I was, uh, he was kind enough just to charge him for the headshot. So I definitely got way more than, you know, what I paid for it. And also, I'd like to thank Jay's for not uh, flipping out and saying, that's not fair. But uh, no, it, it was great. It was amazing. And I'm very happy with it. No, no, I would never do that. I totally, totally understand. It happens. Uh, it's, it's happened to my son before. Um, uh, one thing I will say, one little tip, because um, that might not always happen. There may be um, a time where the artist puts in a lot of time and they're not willing to, to let it go um, for that lower uh, amount. Um, you know, if there's mistakes there, they're probably going to be willing to, or maybe they'll have you split the difference. But um, Drew Edward actually had a little sign-up sheet uh, where we signed up, and, and neither I nor Manny wrote down what we actually uh, had requested. So if they do have a sign-up sheet where you uh, sign, it's always a good idea, you know, a lot of times they'll say yeah, there's a spot for your name and then the character and then uh, like Drew Edward had um, a spot for our phone numbers so he could uh, text us when the commissions were ready. Uh, so you could put like Spider-Man full figure or Spider-Man headshot or, you know, what have you. Uh, that helps uh, clear up any confusion. Um, but yeah, Drew Edward, uh, more than happy to, uh, to let it go uh, for the 25. Uh, it felt like it was his mistake. And uh, yeah, great guy. Really awesome artist, and uh, again, he's one of those. He he, he can fill up. He, he works relatively quickly, but he can fill up. He can uh, probably bang out about eight commissions in a day. Um, but like a big, like I said, a big wow. He he filled up really quickly. So again, somebody I definitely recommend um, getting. And uh, just just a few uh, artists down um, from Drew Edward was uh, Tone Rodriguez. Now. Tone was on my short list of, of people to get something from, but when I walked up to talk to him, I noticed that he had a, was it a print? Or was it a... No, it was a print. Yeah, a print, that's right. It was a print of Rom Space Knight. Now, Rom was one of my favorite characters uh, when I started uh, reading comics, when I was old enough to understand that they came out on a monthly basis and they were in a series, and uh, Rom along with Legion of Superheroes, those were the first two books that I read and made sure to pick up every month and really follow the storyline. And so, uh, ROMs has a special place in my heart. Well, I recently started a ROM sketchbook, and unfortunately, the artist that I had uh, started for me uh, lives on the East Coast, and uh, although I was hoping he would have it done in time uh, for me to bring it to Long Beach, uh, just some things happened and he wasn't able to get it done. So. Once I saw that uh, ROM piece by Tone, I was like, whoa, I have to get a ROM from this guy. I don't have my ROM sketchbook with me, so I'm gonna have to just take a rain check. So I talked to Tone, and uh, we tried to figure out what convention we'd uh, be at next together. I uh, weren't really sure which convention that would be, so uh, I may mail it to him, I may wait till next year, but uh, definitely planning on getting a, a ROM from him. Well, uh, I think that about does it for uh, Artist Alley. Um, 
Think we did say hi to Art Bear also at Artist Alley. Um, can't really remember anybody else that we uh, talked to. Uh, Kyle Higgins and Alex Siegel, the writers on uh, Cal, were there. We said hi to them. Uh, just talked, got a quick signature with Alex and Claire. He was pretty busy. Um, we did. Oh, we did go to uh, Alley V. Yeah, that was on Sunday. Yeah, that was on. Yeah, Sunday we went. And we, uh, we went and saw uh, Ali V. She was also on my short list of people to get something from. Um, I wasn't familiar with her work at all, but again, when I was going through uh, artist by artist, I saw her work, and uh, she was on my list. So, you, so you dropped off your sketchbook first yeah, and had was. and asked her to do a Zatanna. Yeah. That's right. She was fairly inexpensive, uh, so I asked her. Uh, she asked a torso, and uh, looking through her work, obviously fe female characters were her strength. And from the beginning, the two characters I wanted to get were the uh, Captain Cold, which I still haven't got, but a Zatanna also. So uh, the price was right. Uh, she seemed like the right artist. So uh, yeah, left the sketchbook there. And when I picked it up, it 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 was magic. Let's just put it that way. I see what you did there. Yeah, pretty much uh, when once Manny decided uh, that he was going to get a sketch from her, I you know I had said when we originally walked up the table, I was like, oh, Ali B, nice to meet you. You know, you're on my short list of artists I wanted to get, but I still know like fit in my budget. You know, I had kind of spent more than I had planned on already. But once Manny decided to pull the trigger, I was like, you know, I'm gonna end up getting something too. And uh, sure enough, you know, as soon as I saw Manny's uh, Zatanna. I knew that I had made the right choice. So, uh, she's not familiar with a lot of the more traditional characters from the big two. Uh, so, I got some reference on my tablet, uh, which is another good tip. Uh, put some reference on your phone. Uh, if, there's, if you know the character you, the character or characters you want, and uh, if you think maybe the artist might not be familiar, or even, even sometimes with the characters they're familiar with, they just can't quite remember what the boots look like or what the belt looks like, or uh, I remember at San Diego this year, Jim Lee couldn't remember which direction the bird on Hawkman's chest faced. So uh, it, it always helps have a little picture on your tablet or on your phone. So I had some pictures uh, of some uh, Legion characters on my tablet, uh, and I chose for Allie to do White Witch. And uh, again, just much like Manny, uh, I'm very pleased. I know I made the right decision. and. Uh, I'll put a little link down here under the, the picture of the White Witch. You guys can uh, contact Allie for a commission or uh, maybe ask her what she's going to be at a show next if you want to get something done or check out her artwork. So really, really nice girl and a uh, really talented artist. I'm not sure if you got to talk to him much, but uh, I also went up to say hi to Joel Gomez, who uh, had done a previous commission to, for me at a WonderCon. And that actually brings me back to your other comment about references. It's really important. I think it's really important to be specific if you want a character because, for example, Harley Quinn has, uh, has a lot of different varieties of costumes. Uh, Batman has a, has a ton. I mean, I mean Dark Knight Returns, uh, Batman Beyond, there's Batman the Animated Series, there's uh, Greg Capullo's Batman. So, uh, like with Joel, when, when he did my Harley, he uh, he asked me, which Harley do you want, or which Harley can I draw? He actually wanted to draw more of the classic Batman animated series. And, uh, well, anyway, uh, yeah, I went to say, say hi to him. He had some really nice uh, metal printed um, pieces there. And uh, he was also on a, on a panel for um, artists later that day. Yeah, and as, as far as retailers go, uh, there were a few comic vendors, uh, not not a huge amount, but there were definitely some deals to be had. Uh, I didn't do too much searching, uh, bought a few books here or there. Um, there were a couple books I was looking for that I couldn't find, still looking for a, a Wayward number one, and uh, kind of asked around for a Shazam number 28, and that's the first modern appearance of Black Adam. Uh, I have a feeling if there were any of those, uh, there at the show, they kind of got bought up by other dealers, uh, speculating on the popularity of the Rock Dwayne Johnson movie coming out. So I have a feeling they got bought up by fellow dealers uh, probably on setup day. 
So I also spent a uh, good bit of time talking to Dan Brereton uh, about uh, his nocturnals. It's been 20 years, nocturnals. He's very passionate about the uh, property, uh, you know, creator owned. Uh, he showed us some really cool kind of behind the scenes uh, kind of fan uh, film things that are going on. Um, his art is beautiful. Uh, check it out. He's awesome. He's got a, a Kickstarter for a, another Nocturnals book he's going to be uh, putting out pretty soon. So uh, we'll have to keep an eye out for that. I also talked to uh, JT Kroll. Uh, he does uh, Journey over at Aspen Comics. And he has kind of a young uh, reader book out called The Lost Spark. And uh, the sequel to that is going to be uh, coming out. He's hoping later this year in time for Christmas. So um, I plan on, I've read uh, about half of The Lost Spark, and I, I definitely plan on reviewing it. It's not a comic, it's actually a novel, but it's still uh, produced and published by uh, Aspen Comics. So I plan on uh, reviewing that in an upcoming episode, so you guys can uh, keep an eye out for that. So it's good to see JT. Um, on Saturday, I also talked to uh, Frank Mastamoro um, from Aspen Comics. Uh, again, he's a friend. Um, Aspen Comics, they put out some really really beautiful books. They may be uh, the publisher that uh, from their best looking book to their worst looking book uh, art wise, they have the least variation. They just put out some of the most beautiful books. Um, just continuing that, that tradition that uh, Michael Turner started of gorgeous artwork. Uh, beautiful colors, things are well rendered. Um, solid stories. So if you're not familiar with their stuff, um, again, you're at a show, they're there. They do a lot of uh, shows, especially in Southern California. Go and talk to them. Frank's a great guy to talk to. Um, we often find ourselves talking about uh, not just comics, but uh, family and life and things like that. So, Yeah, another cool thing they have is a, a truck where uh, the back of the truck, the like trailer, uh, turned into like a mobile Star Labs from uh, the Flash TV show. Yeah, that's right. Uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, the CW premieres uh, The Flash, as uh, many of you probably are excited about. And uh, as a promo, they had uh, a Star Labs, an interactive experience where we're able to uh, go in, we each get a personal identification card as a researcher, and uh, kind of get a glimpse at you know what it's like to be the flash or what characteristics we need we would need to be the flash and uh, it's really really eye-opening it's really fun it's really interactive you get to take different pictures with motion sensor cameras uh, test your uh, reflection your uh, how fast you can read how many words per minute uh, Jace I think I got to 800 how about you yeah, uh, felt pretty comfortable. I completely understood the, the message at the 800 words per minute, but a thousand was uh, it was a little tough. I kind of got the gist of the message, but uh, and then the, the 1200 was just ridiculous. So they had uh, basically these six screens uh, set up, and they would flash uh, one word, uh, no pun intended, but they would flash one word at a time on the screen, and uh, you'd read it. And uh, so they had 600. No, oh, it started at 200. They had 200 words a minute, 400, then 600, 800, 1,000, and 1,200. So, yeah, really, really tough to read at uh, 1,200 words a minute. So that was pretty cool. Uh, I think the next thing over kind of tested your... Um, your eye, your hand-eye coordination. That's right, hand-eye coordination. So they had this screen set up uh, where these bars would kind of uh, come out from the center toward these buttons that were surrounding the screen. And basically you had to hit the button before the bar reached the edge of the screen. And uh, that was pretty interesting. Man, he kicked my butt. I think I got a score of 19. He got 28. So uh, I'm going to go with uh, the uh, diminished vision in my left eye as <laughs> the reason that you beat me on that one. Uh, and the next thing over was um, kind of a little super speed matrixy kind of thing. You sat down on this stool, and uh, they simultaneously took uh, pictures of you uh, at like 180 degrees and then they uh, would show them up on a screen and uh, they would pan back and forth between uh, all the different pictures and it would kind of look like you were running super fast so that was kind of cool. 
Uh, the next thing was uh, something that had to do with the eyes, right? Yeah, I'm actually quite not quite sure what the, what it was. But uh, the next thing over was uh, it seemed like it was a little bit more fun for the for the volunteers or employees there. They were trying to test your um, reflexes. your reflexes by shooting Nerf missiles at you, and uh, uh, you and I didn't try it out because we knew it was just going to be a failure. But it was definitely fun to see other people getting hit in the face or in the stomach, uh, thinking they could catch it. Obviously, there were some cheaters trying to keep put their hands up already, but uh, yeah. Yeah, you were good. supposed to either dodge or, or catch the missile as it was it was fired after you. And it wasn't just uh, the workers that would fire. Like if you were there with a group of people, you could uh, shoot stuff at your friends. So <laughs> yeah, that was that was pretty fun. I uh, didn't try that one out. I know that, uh, like I said, with the diminished vision on my left eye, I don't have too much in the depth perception uh, range. So knew I had no chance there. Uh, the next one over uh, tested uh, if you could vibrate. Uh, somebody with super speed like the Flash is able to vibrate his body. Um, really fast. So they had this button kind of on the console, and you were supposed to hit it as fast as you could. And uh, I think I tried it a few times, but uh, 86 or 89 was was my high, and then it kind of went down from there. Um, I know there's uh, some friends of mine who uh, kind of power through those video games, pounding on that button in the arcade, you know, as fast as they can, would probably get uh, above 90. But uh, I don't play those games too much anymore, so I was pretty uh, happy with myself with the 86. So that was uh, the Star Labs experience. It was definitely something that was cool, uh, interactive, and uh, something I, I, I never done really done anything like that before. So that was that was really neat. Yeah, definitely fun and a little bit different. I'm not sure if they had it on Saturday, but uh, outside they also had the the board where um, Barry Allen is trying to connect all the pieces to uh, his his mom's murder. Uh, obviously, his father was framed. Yeah, he, so, wants to, he wants to clear his dad's name. So, yeah, so uh, you get a you get a really good look at you know what he's what he's looking at. So uh, definitely really cool, especially if you're looking forward to that show. I think the last thing that we'll mention about uh, Long Beach is all the cosplay. Now, throughout uh, you guys listening to, to Manny and I talk, you've uh, seen a lot of pictures, a lot of great costumes. Um, I think perhaps uh, the greatest. Uh, thing about Long Beach is how friendly the people are. And that definitely uh, extends to the cosplayers. A lot of the uh, creators that we talked to and uh, vendors that we talked to uh, said that, you know, maybe it wasn't the best show financially, but uh, it was made up for by just how nice the people were. Everybody was there having a good time. Uh, certainly didn't hear about any incidents that sometimes you hear about uh, at the bigger shows like San Diego and such. Um, so there was a lot of cosplayers. They were more than happy to pose for pictures. Yeah, an interesting note about um, the cosplay was uh, there was by far the the, mo- the most character, well, the character with the most cosplay was Harley Quinn. Yet on Sunday, uh, Jimmy and Amanda had a panel, the, the psychology of Harley Quinn. The room was full, but not one cosplayer was dressed as Harley. Jimmy Palamani was looking for uh, Harley to sit up with him, yet there was no, nobody in the room to sit with him. So that was an interesting note. Another one is uh, there's a ton, of, uh, a ton of guys dressed as Huntress this year. I thought it was some weird Nightwing, but uh, then they would turn around they'd have arrows. So uh, I'm not sure what's, what's the trend with that, but uh, I don't know about you, but my favorite cosplay of this year was um, had to be the ventriloquist and Scarface because I had never seen that. Yeah, that was uh, that was a pretty good uh, costume. I don't know that I could say what my favorite was. There were a lot of really, really good cosplays. A lot of Harley Quinns. Uh, yeah, definitely weird that at the Harley Quinn panel there was no Harley Quinn. So, uh, But yeah, Jimmy and Amanda, the, you know, the last thing uh, I did was get an, an interview with Jimmy. He was nice enough to give me about 10 minutes. Uh, at, it was actually after the show was already over, about 5.30. Um, I kind of make it a point to always have my last uh, last thing I do at a show that Jimmy and, and Amanda are just, is just to, to go by and, and, and say bye to them and you know tell them how much I enjoy their work. The two uh, nicest people in comics, without question, and they are just, just awesome. Um, yeah, so... My favorite costume, wow, that is a tough one. There were so many good ones. Uh, maybe Tinkerbell. 
<laughs> Tinkerbell may have been my favorite. Uh, the Edward Scissorhands was so good. Uh, Vegas. Uh, she was dressed as Power Girl on uh, Sunday. That was a great costume. Uh, I, I did uh, talk to her. I, I don't know much about cosplay, but I did talk to Vegas, and uh, she's a pretty um, uh, known cosplayer. And she, uh, she's going to be doing uh, an episode with me uh, forthcoming where we talk a little bit about cosplay since I know so little about it. She's going to be nice enough to um, to join me, and uh, maybe we'll, I'll ask her some questions, and those of you that are interested in cosplay can kind of get an idea of how to start. So looking forward to that. Uh, there was also, it's not cosplay, but there was also an R2-D2 that was roaming around on the floor that this guy had built himself. It took him about two years to build it. That was awesome. That got a lot of attention. Uh, we saw a Ninja Turtle that was really cool. Um, oh, I, the the Rocket Raccoon and the Star-Lord. You were with me when oh, I saw I them. Th those were really great costumes. Uh, the Iron Man on Saturday was really good. The Iron Man on Saturday was good. Uh, the Transformer I saw on Sunday was really done really well. Uh, yeah, there were just a lot of really, really, really great costumes. Saw Great Princess Leia, uh, Great Tuscan Raider. Yeah, there were just a lot of great costumes. And uh, I'd say this convention, more so than any other, uh, really spent uh, a lot of time kind of trying to get some... Uh, some good pictures for you guys to check out uh, and subscribe and just kind of dedicated a lot of time on Sunday to just uh, giving you guys an idea of what it's like to go to a convention so I can have this episode out for you and uh, I know not all of you are live in places where it's convenient to get to uh, a con so hopefully this gives you a little bit of the experience and it was pretty enjoyable um, most of the time when I go to a, a convention I'm so focused on getting sketches getting uh, autographs or talking to creators maybe I, I don't quite leave enough time to just kind of soak up the atmosphere and uh, check out the cosplayers and, and take pictures of the cosplayers and talk to them and uh, talk to other fellow fans so I, I really made a point to do that this time and uh, it was it was very enjoyable it was a, a little bit of a different con experience for me than I've had in the past but uh, yeah definitely a great show so I want to thank you all for watching I hope you enjoyed this uh, episode and I want to thank Manny for being my co-pilot this weekend Oh, well, my pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. It was uh, it was nice to know that I was part of the only interview that Jimmy Palamati gave this weekend. That's right. Jimmy Palmiati exclusive interview from uh, Long Beach Comic Con. That will be coming up uh, here. I'm going to play it right here at the end of the episode. So once again, I want to thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. This is Jace from the Comic Source here with uh, comic creator extraordinaire Jimmy Palmiotti. How was it. your show, Jimmy? It was fantastic, excessively busy, wonderful panels, really cool. good time. Cool. All right, just a few questions here sure. for our uh, viewers. Sure. So let me uh, just rattle off some names real fast. Okay. Joe Casada, okay. J. Scott Campbell, Dale Keown, Sam Keith, some of the most popular comic book creators of the 90s, along right. with yourself. Now, some of them are still involved in the industry, some not. Right. Definitely they don't put out any sort of books on a monthly basis like you do. Right. right. So my question is, right. to what do you attribute your longevity well, in business? Well, it, it's, it's not that. It's, it's it, those are lazy bastards. And, okay. Uh, <laughs> and I pretty much know. I... I, I you know, may, it, maybe they, uh, they've they taken different directions. Like a guy like Joe is working up at Marvel and doing the TV and movie stuff. And... Uh, and Jay Scott's doing his pinup stuff. His right. So they found their niche. They found the right. thing they like to do. Um, in the 90s, I was mostly inking and a little right. bit of writing. Now I'm writing full time and doing other things. I just find that there's so much I want to do, and uh, that pretty much feeds my drive to keep working. So, so you, I'm a maniac. So you love the monthly. I, I love it. I love the format. comics. I love doing this stuff. So it's it's a job that honestly. I won't say I won't do it. I would do it for nothing, but I would do it for next to nothing. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And so your current monthly book that's coming out from DC is uh, Star Spangled War Story, starring GI Zombie. Yep. That. And what hopes do you have for that series? I hope that it lasts past issue six, and uh, I <laughs> uh, hope that Scott Hampton stays on it, and I hope yeah, we he's gain killing it. we get we gain some readership because right now it's not selling that well. So I'm hoping we get a little more people. Maybe with the Future's End story, we can cool. sucker in some new people. Right on. Uh, do you have anything? 
sales, uh, DC projects, anything in just the pipe the, right now? You know, Harley Quinn is monthly and, and GI Zombie, and uh, that's it right now for right. DC. But you, you know. do have a Kickstarter, I heard you mention that. Yeah, uh, Sex and Violence ended, and we have one. It's a Western that we'll announce in a couple of weeks. Uh, it's a graphic novel. It's uh, hardcore uh, Western. It's the kind of book that we couldn't do. At DC that we're going to do okay. on Kickstarter. And are you writing that solo or with No, your, I'm writing with Justin. With Justin, you know, yeah, Justin yeah, Gray? Yeah, okay, yeah. and can you tell us who the artist is going to be on that? Uh, not yet. Not yet? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, my last question actually deals with your uh, top 10 monthly book, Harley Quinn. Okay. So, when the new 52 was first announced, there was a lot of uproar about the change in Harley's costume. Right. She's certainly seen an evolution as a character mm -hmm. so far in the last three years since the new 52 started. Sure. Um, and it seems to me like her popularity is kind of at an all-time high. I know when the monthly book first started out, the numbers were real good on one, and then they kind of dipped down, and then now it's just going crazy. Uh, yeah, I think I think we uh, got lucky. I think uh, because it's not in continuity so heavy, I think a lot of people picked it up, and are still picking it up, and then buying back issues. So it's word of mouth. Uh, we're offering a book that's fun and silly and crazy and... Uh, you don't have to read the history of DC Comics to get it. Um, has beautiful covers by Amanda. Chad Harden's artwork is beautiful in it. So it's it's just a it's like the perfect storm of uh, talent and story and character. And I think that we hit had a great time. So we're getting a big female audience, a younger audience in it, and uh, it's a good lesson on uh, experimenting more. I think in a DC uh, line. Well, I think it's a great book. It's definitely fun. It's lighthearted, and I think a lot of those people that maybe didn't like the way Harley looked or acted in this new DC New 52 are kind of eating their words right now. Well, I, so. I, you know, some people react, like gut reaction, right? They're like, I don't like it, and then they Give try it, it sense, later. Right? Yeah, it's sort of like the first bite of food, you know? You're like, I don't know if I like this in three bites, and you're like, that's pretty good, actually, you know? You just got to get used to it. So we just plow ahead, hope to gain the audience we can, and we keep trying to make the book better, you know. Uh, we got issue 11, 12, and 13 have Power Girl in it. Yeah, looking forward so to that. So we'll get the people that like Power Girl and maybe give it a shot. You know, we don't, we're, we're trying everything we can, but in the end we're just writing a true to character, and I think in the end that's what matters, and, and that's what people react to. And it must be a joy to get to work with your wife on the book, Absolutely. right? That's a lot of fun. She's, we work in the house, we laugh when we work, and you know, there's a joy when we're working, so I think it's reflected in the book. Okay, great. Well, thanks for taking the time, Jimmy. My pleasure. Let's make sure that all our listeners are picking up Harley Quinn and definitely pick up G.I. Zombie. It's my highest possible recommendation. Really fun book. It's definitely not what you would expect uh, from a war comic. So we'll see you next time, guys.